Hi, my name is Dr. Tibor Lazar. I'm owner and surgeon of Lazar Veterinary Surgery. I'm now going to talk about a condition called laryngeal paralysis and its surgical treatment by arytenoid lateralization. So first a little bit of background. Uh, laryngeal paralysis refers to a condition where the laryngeal apparatus, uh, the cartilage that controls the airway, stops working. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on something called acquired idiopathic laryngeal paralysis. Uh, and so essentially there are some rare cases where dogs are born with this condition. And I'm not going to talk about that. Those are very complicated conditions that uh, may not be effectively treated, potentially. Uh, there is also a condition of polyneuropathy. In some dogs, they will have neuro a neurologic abnormality in other locations of the body, and the larynx or the airway is just one aspect of the full condition. But by far the most common uh, occurrences of laryngeal paralysis occurs for unknown reasons. The word idiopathic means we just don't know why it happens, and acquired um, is certainly the situation. These dogs are older. Golden Retrievers, Labradors, Rottweilers, dogs that are 12, 13, 14 years of age. We'll see it rarely in small breed dogs and even more rarely in cats. Primarily it's a condition of the older large breed dog. What owners will be noticing is either a sudden or a gradual onset of increased breathing sounds, a more labored breathing. Initially it just appears to be panting but then it becomes more obvious that there is some uh, increased effort that goes along with it. Uh, it becomes most apparent in the warmer temperatures or during or after activity. The reason is uh, that dogs will release their heat uh, through panting and if the airway is not fully open then it makes it very difficult to release the heat. The airway swells. Some dogs can approach a crisis situation where they just effectively can't breathe and uh, sometimes they will present to the emergency clinic for uh, emergency treatment. Well, let me talk a little bit about uh, some anatomy and I apologize for the drawings. They are my own and they're not great, but it should get the point across. So on the top half is looking at some normal anatomy. What we're looking at here, the brown thick lines represent the arytenoid cartilages uh, these are supposed to open and close during uh, normal breathing and, uh, and eating as well. What we're looking at, to give you some perspective, is looking right into the mouth. Imagine a dog is opening his mouth wide and you're looking straight in. So down below would be the tongue, up top would be the palate. Um, so the green area represents the airway. When a dog is breathing, the cartilages are fully open and they and we can see right down in the airway it's easy for them to get air in and get air out. Now these cartilages do have a normal function, they move for a reason and that's because as a dog or cat uh, eats and drinks we don't want to have the food or water to go down the airway. And So what we're seeing here on the right is when the cartilages come back together and then you can see just perhaps a tiny bit of the airway, but this per, uh, allows the food and water to go down into the esophagus, into the stomach, and to prevent a condition called aspiration pneumonia, where uh, the, the material would get down into the lungs. Um, so in a normal anesthetized animal, a dog that is asleep and we're looking deep into the airway, we should see a movement of this cartilage. It's opening, it's closing during breathing, and this is how we determine, uh, uh, definitively diagnose that a dog has the condition laryngeal paralysis. If the cartilages are moving, we know that that condition doesn't exist. But if on the other hand the cartilages are in a static position, in a mostly closed position, and that's what I have down here below, then that gives us the definitive diagnosis of laryngeal paralysis. So what I'm demonstrating here is that the cartilages are not completely closed, so some air is able to pass. Very commonly, the cartilages will be thick as well, and this is from the increased effort. They're red, they're inflamed, uh, especially if there's been any kind of a crisis situation. Um, we'll get to that drawing in a moment. That's uh, following surgery. So once we've made the diagnosis that a dog has laryngeal paralysis, the next step is to talk about surgery. Certainly some owners will elect not to do surgery for health reasons for the dog or for a number of other reasons. Uh, and some dogs will be able to manage uh, 
without surgery, but it is a danger. It's an accident waiting to happen. It's extremely important that you keep your pet in a cool environment and low stress because if, if your pet does get too warm or the stress level causes increased breathing, increased panting, they can very rapidly turn into a crisis situation of breathing and you may not even have time to get to the emergency clinic. So surgery uh, certainly it has um, a very important function in this condition. So I'll now talk about the surgical procedure. It's called arytenoid lateralization. Arytenoid is the name of the cartilage. Lateralization means opening the cartilage to the side. Uh, there have been a number of techniques described over the years, but this one is, has been giving the most consistent good results, um, getting the dogs to breathe quite well with the fewest complications, which I'll talk about later. What we do is make an incision in the side of the neck, typically the left side, but not always, uh, and then we will literally tie the cartilage. It's called a tie-back procedure. We tie it to a second cartilage to hold it in its open position. So now when we look in the airway, um, there is a bit of a kink to the left side of the cartilage as it's being pulled out towards the side. The other side we leave uh, in place. So we've basically improved the airway opening by about 50%, which is sufficient for a dog to function, to breathe normally and uh, have a, a happy life. Uh, it has been attempted to try to tie back both cartilages, but then uh, there can be serious complications of aspiration pneumonia, food and water getting down into the airway. So again, this is what I expect to see when I'm done with the surgery, and uh, as long as I see that, we're done. It's a fairly quick surgery, and most patients will do very well, but there are some risks involved. Uh, first, I'll just mention the minor complications bruising, swelling, redness. Uh, it's not unusual to see those uh, in, in many of the pets going through the surgery. The major complications are certainly the more concerning. Um, in the short term, there can be a, a respiratory crisis, potentially even in the overnight following surgery. If there is uh, a tremendous amount of swelling in the airway, then uh, it's extremely important that your pet is monitored uh, over the first 24 hours to ensure that uh, there is no difficulties with breathing that perhaps would become worsened with surgery. Uh, it's a potential that this tie back, if for some reason, would fail, the cartilage would break, perhaps even the suture would break. I think that would be unusual. But uh, again, uh, we would have a pretty good idea in the hours following surgery whether something like that were to occur. The biggest complication that we are concerned about following the surgery is aspiration pneumonia. And that is fluid, uh, water, food, even vomit, uh, getting down into the airway, there is about a 15% lifetime risk of aspiration pneumonia. So that means that this could happen the day of surgery or it could happen two, three years later. It's extremely important to be aware of this because as long as it's caught early, it can be effectively treated in most cases. So the signs that you're going to see with aspiration, uh, certainly some coughing, some gagging, these are some things that might make you pay a little bit more attention. Certainly loss of appetite, lethargy, just not being very active. Um, these would be warning signs as well. Difficulty breathing, of course, would be as well. If we see any of these signs, then you should check with your family veterinarian uh, right away and with an x-ray, with blood work, typically we can make the diagnosis fairly easily. It's treated with antibiotics. We need to be aggressive with the treatment. And there's potentially other treatment involved depending on how, um, how chronic the pneumonia is and how widespread the pneumonia is. Uh, owner satisfaction tends to be extremely high. 15% is a relatively high number, but when you consider what your pet was like before the surgery, uh, what it tells us is that 85% of the pets will not have aspiration pneumonia and will have a uh, quite normal life uh, following surgery. And even in that 15%, uh, most of these dogs will ultimately survive with uh, some additional therapy. Now, as far as the aftercare goes, uh, this is also important. We want to decrease the chance for aspiration pneumonia uh, for a lifetime, I would strongly urge that your pet never be allowed to swim again. Dogs that swim in the water uh, have a tendency to get 
water into the mouth, which in this situation will go down into the airway and can cause either drowning or uh, pneumonia, certainly. So swimming should be out. Some dogs that eat very quickly have a tendency to get the food down into the airway as well. So slowing down the eating can be very beneficial. Uh, there are different ways to do it. Some people will elevate the, the food, put the bowl high up, and that, that may slow the dog down. Spilling the food on the ground potentially is helpful, putting in multiple bowls. You may have to be creative in finding out what works best for your pet. In the immediate post-surgical period, for at least the first two weeks, we like to change the consistency of the food. Instead of dry food or wet food, we do what's called a meatball consistency food. Uh, either it's the, a canned food or it's a dry food that is soaked with water, and then you will squeeze it with your hand and get it into meatball type of a, a size and a consistency food, separate them out in the bowl or on the ground. The idea of this is that we don't have the dry particles um, that would occur in just a plain dry food that may go down the airway, and it's also not as sloppy wet as some uh, foods may be, and so then we don't have the liquid going down the airway. So dogs have a tendency to just pick up the meatball and swallow it whole with uh, less chance of food or water getting down the airway. You can feed your pet that way for life. I think that's a great option. But many owners find that after the first two, perhaps even to three weeks, that they could start switching back to a, a more normal diet but uh, if you're noticing increased coughing and gagging, then uh, I would be very careful. I typically recommend that we just don't feed dry food unless it's wetted down to some degree because of the dry particles. So to sum up, it is a surgery that does have some complications in the short term and the long term, but considering how, how affected most of these dogs are when we t discuss the uh, possibility of having surgery, it truly has been a, a life-saving surgery and owners have been very happy with the results um, and dogs tend to recover very quickly.